Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome onto the show Jason Shapiro. Uh, he is the founder of Crowded Market Report, um, and also uh, he was he was featured in one of the the Market Wizards books, the Unknown Market Wizards, um, where a lot of people that were you know not not the ones that you see on the TV screens all the, all the time, not the big you know self promoters, but uh, you know those that were kind of that slowly just plodding away, making making a killing in the market year after year. And I guess, Jason, uh, you kind of fall in that category. So thanks a lot for being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. So um, when I was reading that chapter on you, it was, it was funny because you kind of got your start by reading the Market Wizards books. <laughs> and so did you ever think that you were going to be, uh, you know, featured in, in one of those books, uh, you know, in, in your career? The very first thing I did when I made my very first trade in the market was I went to the bookstore to buy a book just to learn what the hell I was doing. And um, it just happened to be the first Market Wizards book, which at the time was in the bookstore. So it was like, yeah, right on the, on the shelf there. And I was like, oh, this looks kind of cool. Bunch of, you know, picture of a wizard or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah. And I read it that day. Um, I was finished by the time I went to sleep that night. Um, and it's really been that first Market Wishes book, I would say to this day, has been the the real basis of, of what I do now um, and what I should have started doing a lot earlier. <laughs> Did I ever think I would be in a book? You know, you, you're 21 years old. You know, you read a book about these guys. You're like, oh, one day I'd love to be, you know, blah, 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 right? And then when I actually got the chance to be in the book, I really didn't want to quite frankly. <laughs> uh, it's just funny how life goes. You know what I mean? It's like, once you get there, you don't want to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I agreed to do it. I like Jack a lot. He's a good guy. Um, and all my friends were like, come on, man. Uh, we used to quote that book, you know, 40 times a day when we were back when we were kids. Right. Um, so, you know, I agreed to do it and, and I don't, I don't regret it. Um, yeah. it, it, it's got me to, uh, to meet some very, very nice, cool people. Oh. Well, and we certainly don't regret you being in there because I think you had a lot of very valuable insights. And most importantly, um, what what really comes across from your style is the contrarian view and how you you basically are looking at what everyone else is doing and saying, hey, if I'm going to get outsized returns, I have to not do that. That's right. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty simple, right? Pretty well, I mean, if you're going to try and get outsized returns and by definition, you can't be doing whatever because everybody can't get outsized returns. So Yeah. So in that regard, uh, I want to just real quickly, because this is going to kind of, I guess, really kind of tell us about your whole system, because you really use the commitment of traders uh, information. Uh, this is something that is available free from the CFTC. Um, what does that stand for? Commodities, Commodities Trading Commission. Trading Commission. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes you forget what the acronyms st stand for, but, um, so there's I something I've seen more for those people too, but uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll maybe put up a chart real quick and maybe you can walk us through what it is that we're looking at, because I think this will kind of help inform, um, when we're looking at markets and we're looking at the things that you do, um, a little bit of what, what, what you're seeing and how you're doing your analysis. So, you know, if you're thinking about, okay, you're trying to be contrarian, right? Um, what I learned over time was trying to be contrarian. Price is a mistake, right? Like, hey, this thing's gone up a lot, so I'm going to short it. Or this thing's gone down a lot, so I'm going to buy it. That's not contrarian to me. That's stupid, right? Yeah. And and not to say that I haven't done that, okay? Uh -huh. in, in my first years, that, that's what I used to try and do. And they always say, you know, contrarians get run over. That's why contrarians get run over, right? You're 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 trying to be contrarian price, mm -hmm. um, which means you're fading every trend, right? Which is just a mistake over time. So what do you try to be contrarian? I try to be contrarian positioning, right? So to me, it's not, hey, this stocks or this whatever asset has gone up a lot, so I'm going to short it. Mm -hmm. I don't look at it like that. I look at it like everyone in the world is long this thing, so I'm going to short it, right? So how do you know if everybody in the world is long this thing, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you get this kind of data? So this to me, um, does a decent job of that because this is data that the CFTC releases about positioning in the futures markets. And the reason they have this data um, broken up like this is that uh, if you open up a futures account, there, there are three kind of groups. The first group is a commercial account, right? 
Mm -hmm. So if you're a farmer and you're hedging your wheat exposure, right? Then you get to call yourself a commercial trader. And you want to call yourself a commercial trader because you get reduced margin if you do that. Right. You actually have the underlying, you know, if you're an oil producer. You've got the physical asset to back it up. So you get less margin charge, right? So on this chart that you're looking at, that's the red line. Those are the commercial traders. That's their positioning, right? Everybody else is a speculator. So now there's two types of speculators. One is for every market, when you're trading futures, if you get over a certain amount of contracts, you have to report it. And, mm -hmm. and they do that because they don't want anybody trying to come in there and corner a market, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are a reportable position, which I call large speculators, but they call reportable positions, that's the blue line, right? Mm -hmm. and those are the big guys because the other open interest is so much bigger, right? And everybody else, me, you, whoever is just trading around the futures is a small speculator or a non-reportable position. And that's the yellow line, mm -hmm. right? So if we look at that, when we see like in the Euro, and this comes out every week. So the red means that the commercials are super short here, Euro. And the speculators, both large and small, if you look at even just eyeball that chart and see where it is compared to history, you can see they're both super long there, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... What my process does is I'm sort of picking market turns, right? So I use this and I believe a market turn, not always, but the ones that work for me are the ones where these speculators are super long and mm -hmm. therefore the commercials are super short. It's always going to be the opposite because for every long is a short, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I look at this and it gets there and it says, okay, commercials are super short here. Speculators are super long. I'm looking to get short. Mm -hmm. in that situation because the positioning is telling me these people are way too low. People mm -hmm. who have the tendency to lose money over time, speculators are way too low. So I'm going to look for a place to fade that. Okay. And so where, what, where is that place? So you, you're looking at these, the, these could going through a number of these currencies and you, you notice the euro where you're, you're, it's the, that kind of big divergence that you're looking for. Where's kind of the trigger where, okay, now's the time to start getting into, uh, start actually executing a trade. Right. So I think that's probably a more important question than even the, the, the this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think just like any process that you use, um, I don't really care what it is. Um, I'm a strong believer that you have to have market confirmation before you do anything, right? Hey, I think this stock is going to go up. Okay, that's great. But where are you going to buy it, right? right? So I like to look for market confirmation. So for me, again, as a turn picker, um, what I look for in market confirmation is what I call news failure. So here's everybody getting along this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And now you get, and, and I start to pay attention. Well, why are they been getting along? What's the fundamental story that they're listening to? Not necessarily, I believe it, but that's what they're listening to. And that's what they're, they're playing. So you get a piece of news that supports that fundamental story and the market should go up. And it doesn't, it, it probably gaps up, goes up. And by the end of the day, it closes negative on the day. Right. Mm -hmm. And like one of these reversal candles or something like that. Right. That to me is the trigger. The market is now rejecting the new, the bullish news. So when is it going to go up? If it's not going to go up on, on giving people the news that they want, then when is it going to go up? Right. Right. So I, I short it on that day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which gives me a few things. One, it gives me a market confirmation, which I think is very important. It also gives me a great place to stop out because I know where I'm wrong, right? Yes. It, this thing's been going up for a year. The good news came out today. Somebody bought that thing on the highs. They waited for a year until the good news came out and then they bought it. Right. That person right. should never make money, right? That's right. Not, the markets aren't that easy, right? Yeah. So there's my stop, right? If it goes through that high, well, if I'm picking a turn, and the market makes a new high, well, then I didn't get the turn, right? Right. So I stopped it there. So those are really the, the most important things about it. You know, you were talking earlier about risk management. That's the most important thing yes. about all of this, right? Is I have a defined stop that makes sense. It's not like, oh, I'm going to risk, you know, half a point. It's nothing random like that. Right. What on the chart that really makes sense. So I'm going to stop there. And now I have my entry, which I know. I have my stop, which I know. I know how much I want to risk per trade. Mm -hmm. So I know how much sizing to put on for that individual trade. So it gives me kind of all of those things. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Over time is really what's important. You know what I mean? This picking exactly. with action stuff, you know, 
is great. But like, listen, less than half of my trades end up making money, right? Right. But because of the risk management side of it all, you know, I make like four to one on my winners. So if I can lose one, lose one, make four, lose one, lose one, make four, lose one, lose one, you know, and <laughs> no matter what, I'm, that's the game that I want to play. You know, I'm not yeah. trying to be right. You know, I'm not trying to predict better than the future better than anybody else. I'm just playing an odds game. That's mm -hmm. all I'm doing. Like I, I, I'm saying, you guys, I'm just counting cards. That's yeah. All I'm doing. And when you count cards, it doesn't mean that you're going to win every hand, right? Yeah. Um, it just means you're putting the odds slightly in your favor. So mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily think that this stuff puts the odds in my favor in terms of which way the market's going to go. I think it puts the odds in my favor where if I make, I'm going to make four. And if I lose, I'm going to lose one. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And actually, so Jason, I, I think for our listeners, maybe go over what uh, one of your signals last October, right? When when the CPI number came out and, and was at that kind of extreme level. And that turned out to be a pretty big signal uh, for the stock market for you. So I think that the lows of the stock market was a perfect example of what I'm talking about with the news failure thing, right? Mm -hmm. Where the market had been going down all year because everybody was freaking out because the Fed was raising rates and... CPI kept coming out higher and there was no end in sight to the rating rates. And on, the, on that day in October, the CPI came out higher than expected, which ended up being the high CPI number of the year. We only know that in retrospect, but at the time it's like CPI is only going up. Here's a new high in CPI higher than expected coming in. Clearly bearish the stock market. And sure enough, the stock market was down a lot, like 2% on that day at one point and closed the day up on the day. So there it is. If they're not going to be able to sell the stock market at that point on a higher CPI number, then when the hell are they going to be able to sell the stock market? Right. You know? right. and, and the point with the, the positioning is, well, why aren't they selling it? Well, to me, I will answer because they're already short. Okay. So if you're already short, then who's left to sell? Right? Mm -hmm. and therefore, yeah. the thing can go the other way. So that's a good example of, um, of that news failure stuff. Now, in fairness, I didn't get long that day. Because my seal, this commitment of trader stuff was not extreme at that time. Oh, okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. When it got extreme was like in early January. Got extreme. There was a news failure in there again somewhere. I forget exactly what it was, but um, it was probably on another CPI number or it was on some other number that was bearish. Um, and we reversed up and I got long there in January and was okay. sort of sitting long the stock market up until about four or five weeks ago. Yeah, do you, do you you want to show? Do you want to show one of the charts that maybe uh, reflects? Yeah, how you got all that equity thing on there. Okay. Yeah, so under the mark. Oh yeah, equities. Uh huh. So you can see, you, you can look at any of them. I was doing Nasdaq. So if you look at the Nasdaq, you see where the red is like way way up there in January, yeah, 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 yeah. and blue and the yellow is way way down there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and you can see in October wasn't really that that wasn't necessarily the case, but in January it was right. And it's funny, you never know how positioning is going to go. You know what I mean? Like in this particular case, the market was off the lows, but they sold right into that, right? Mm -hmm. So then they got crowded short. And then that's when I then, you know, started to get long. A lot of times it happens right at the exact low or right at the exact high. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, I can't remember uh, in the COVID thing, mm -hmm. um, the market was, the positioning was kind of neutral coming into COVID. The first two weeks of COVID, the stock market went down. And everybody bought that first dip huge, wow. right? And because, you know, it's easy for us to see now, well, gee, why would anybody buy that if there was a global pandemic? We didn't know it. Uh, right, yeah. We How all, bad. You know, we thought it was like, you know, bird flu. That was the first thing, right? Everybody thought right. it would be like another bird flu, right? So they bought the hell out of that first dip. Yeah. And then that gave me a chance to get short. And then the market dropped like 30% a month, right? Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And people will argue, well, it only went down 30% because it turned to a global pandemic. And I will sit here, and you can't prove it one way or the other. I will sit here and argue the reason it went down so much is because everybody was so long. You know, if everybody was short going into that, I don't think it would have gone down. That that's way. true. But yeah. We can't prove it one way or the other. That's, okay? right. that's how I look at it. Well, and on the flip side, too, um, it was amazing. And, and this is where we have, we, we have our own signal, the follow through day that we were using on April 2nd of 2020 and April 6th of 2020. And it was really kind of hard to believe that we were getting a positive signal when the news was like horrible. It was just like, you know, there was so much uncertainty, but we got that signal and the market kept on going up. And I remember on, on that day, 
I was on Yahoo Finance and, you know, was saying, well, we got this follow through day and it's, you know, looking positive. And one of the guests afterwards in like the green room was saying, there's no way that this is the bottom. Yeah. And it was. <laughs> and I, I didn't I didn't think it would have been the bottom. But sure enough, uh, it never makes sense right, <laughs> right. at the bottom. And it never makes sense at the top. You know, I always say markets bottom on bad news. And markets top on good news. Now, yeah. That I can tell you as a guy who's been picking market turns for over 20 years. Okay. That's just how it happens. And it happens by that, by definition, because it'll bottom when everybody's super short and they've discounted in. See, to me, positioning is the discounting mechanism in the markets for me, not price positioning, mm -hmm. right? So everybody's going to be short because the market's been going down because of all the bad news and it only gets worse. And that's why they're so short. But then it turns, as you know, you know, the fundamentals follow them. The market's way ahead of the fundamentals, right? Right, right exactly. Um, so it's always going to look like that. And that's why people are always like, oh, well, if you're telling everybody how you do this, don't you think they're going to steal it from you and it's going to go away? I'm like, good luck, man. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't easy. You know? it, it ain't easy being a contrarian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> market turns like that. It, it, it's just not easy, right? Because you're buying when everybody in the world is, is telling you to sell and you're selling when everyone in the world is telling you to buy. And from your education of economics or whatever is also telling you at the turns that, that you should be selling out, you should be buying, right? So mm -hmm. um, it's not easy to do. Um, I do it because I have that kind of personality anyway. I've always kind of been like this, you know? I've always kind of been like, you know, hey, everybody's telling me to go left, so I'm going to go right. And everyone's going to tell me to go right, and I'm going to go left. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of fortunate that I found what I do because that doesn't work in a lot of, places in life um you know you get fired from a lot of jobs that one right <laughs> i've gotten fired from every job i ever have had my son just got promotion i was like you know i've never been promoted in my life <laughs> i was fired i'm right from the first job i had as a bus boy i can't think of a single job that i wanted well the last job that i had at a hedge fund i was not fired from other than that i i think i was fired from every job i was at well, well, let's talk a little bit about where the market is right now. So if we look at, let's say, the NASDAQ um, uh, commitment of traders, uh, you, you, you kind of showed us how we were getting a little bit at the extreme level. You saw a lot of the blue uh, was getting on the short side in January. Um, and it looked like that blue, and again, these little large speculators kind of flipped in, in May and June. Was that, was that enough of a flip to kind of say, hey, we're at a market turn, or are we still kind of in that that no, so it was neutral, you know. Okay. So the, I was out of the Nasdaq then, and then the other ones they were getting short. I think the S and P or the Dow, and I kind of flipped out of the Nasdaq, and I flipped into the the Dow. You can see where the Dow all of a sudden they were super short. Yeah, oh, right. look at that. I kind of flipped into Dow, and at one point I think it was S and P, and then I flipped out of the S and P into the Dow. Um, wow, look at the S and P. Yeah, right. See that? So, yeah. um, so like the way that I do it. And there's a number of reasons for this, but I'm trading like the turn mm -hmm. until this stuff goes neutral, right? If my edge is that everybody is crowded short, then when they're not crowded short, I'm getting out. It yeah. doesn't mean the market can't keep going up, you know, all the way until they get super crowded long. It just means that what I do is that, that that's the piece that I get, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's not only a trading thing. From a trading point of view, I have found with testing, the best thing I can do from a P&L point of view over time is to buy it and keep it all the way until they get super crowded long and then sell it and get short there. Okay. But after it goes sort of through the neutral thing, the volatility of my returns really starts to go up a lot more, right? Because mm -hmm. at that point, I'm a trend follower and it starts to look like trend following returns, right? Maybe positive, but we're a lot more volatility, right? So A, I don't want that. And B, as a business, you know, what my business is, is I have a return stream that has very high negative correlation to things like macro and things like trend following all that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why people allocate money to me. Not right. It's not just my looks <laughs> because then hey, she's laughing. Um, it's because they, you know, those, that's what my return stream is, right? They can yeah. get this beta anywhere, right? right. Um, it's very <laughs> difficult to get the alpha that my stuff gives. So yeah. that's what I do. Um, so it doesn't mean the stock market can't be going up just because it's gone neutral, you know. But yeah, you're offering that that non-correlation, which is a value in and of itself. Well, yeah, I'm casting that sort of low to here. 
And then, yeah. okay, from here, trend followers can take over and, and that's their job. You know, my job's done. Now they can do their job. Right. Well, we're going to get into this a little bit more, how you came up with this method uh, after the break. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Yeltsin here, your host, along with Arusha Paris, a portfolio manager from O'Neill Global Advisors. And our special guest this week is Jason Shapiro, founder of the Crowded Market Report, uh, one of the featured um, uh, traders in the Unknown Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. So real pleasure to have him on talking about his contrarian method. And uh, Jason, I, I kind of did a little bit of math and you said that you've been at this uh, contrarian approach, you know, the, getting these market turns for 20 years. But I was I was kind of doing the math and I think you've been at this for over 30 years. So what happened to the the first 10? What do they call that lost decade? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you know, I started trading as a kid, you know, I, I got involved just like, uh, most people do. Right. At the time I was living in Hong Kong, which is like the early nineties okay. job that I was bored at. And there was this bull market going on around me and I was like, Hey, let's get involved, man. That sounds like easy money, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I got caught up in that whole bull market thing and, and did, I think things very similar to what everybody does, which is over levered, thought I was a genius. You know, I mean, if I did the math of the money I made the first nine months I was involved in the market, then like within a decade, I was, you know, going to be George Soros, right? You extrapolated that out. Of course. <laughs> Isn't that what we all were? Yeah. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I just like most people, that's what I, I got caught in. And of course, I had no way of knowing when the bull market was going to end. And when it ended, I was too over leveraged and I gave all that back, right? Um, and then uh, I, I learned about shorting. And so I started shorting the bear market. I made money there. And then I was like, over the moon, right? Yeah. Um, nothing better than making money shorting the market, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, I did the same thing. I didn't know when the bear market was going to end, so I got caught, you know, in that, and just like people kind of did this year, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I lost all the money back there. And then I sort of went through again. I don't think my experience is very different than than most other people because we're all the same for the most part, right? We all mm -hmm. in that normal distribution curve, yeah. so. You know, then I went through the whole thing of, okay, read books, you know, read Warren Buffett books, read technical analysis books, read trading psychology books, you know, read all these Larry Williams books and how I made a million dollars in the stock market and, you know, read all these books. And, and I went through that whole process of learning and figured now I was good. And I spent the next 10 years kind of going through the whole boom bust thing, make a bunch of money, lose it back, make a bunch of money, lose it back and had some good times along the way. Um, but after 10 years, I looked at myself and I was like, I've gotten nowhere. You know, I, I should have just been dollar cost averaging the S and P index this entire time. I would have been much better off. Right. So I kind of came to the conclusion of, I, I have to figure out what I'm going to do here because this is a waste of time. Right. Um, I either got to get a job and keep doing this as a hobby for fun. Or I have to figure if I want to do this full time, I have to really figure out how it's going to work. Um, mm -hmm. And I had always kept a very good diary of my trading, which was based on the fact that I was reading these books and these guys were always like, keep a diary and all that. So I was able to go back through my diary and, and go through and look at, you know, what trades were working over time, not what worked one time, but didn't work the other 20 times. And I only remember the one time because it was so right. good, right? <laughs> really what works over time with one selective day. memory a selective memory that's right so you know I, I slowly threw away the things that weren't working and tried to focus on the things obviously that, that were working and slowly start to develop a process and, and that has become this process there was a big one that happened to me um in the ni late 90s at the end of the internet bubble uh -huh. it, it was obvious to anybody paying attention yeah that that was a bubble, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you would go out to lunch and everybody at the restaurant was talking about how they were making millions of dollars trading AOL and trading, mm -hmm. you know, what are all these different stocks, right? Right. It was a classic sort of shoeshine boy giving stock tips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I clearly, being Mr. Contrarian, wanted to short that. The problem was I started shorting it in August and the market oh, from gosh. August to January went up another 40%. You know? <laughs> so right. I had learned enough about risk management and stopping out that I didn't blow out then. Yeah. But I definitely lost money. Um, and that was like, what am I missing here? Right. Um, 
and it goes back to you know you can be right but early and if you're early it's just like being wrong you know so how can i and i started looking for things of how can i avoid this you know um and one was the market confirmation thing right but mm -hmm. another was i came across this commitment of traders i don't remember how but looking at it it was very clear that like you wouldn't have gotten a sell signal on this stuff in the stock market until january and february of 2000 it would have it would have had me avoid shorting it the whole way all the way until january mm -hmm. and i find a big part of it you know this data is no magical perfect data or anything it does two things for me it helps me get this risk reward in my favor over time but it also keeps me out of trouble which is just as important yeah as anything else right so like in that particular case i didn't have to get long in the stock market but it wouldn't have let me get short the stock market all the way until january 2000 and that would have saved me mm -hmm. a lot of time and a lot of pain and a lot of sleepless nights right so that kind of struck a, a chord with me um and so from then i've been really looking at this data and working with this data pretty extensively so are there times when yeah, kind of going out of that theoretical example that you would have stayed out of the market um, during those four months in, in the, the late 90s. Are there times where you're just completely out of the market for a while because you're not seeing any market or any currency at those extreme levels? Oh, yeah. There, there's very rare, but not never. Okay. Oh, God, how positions are. Mm -hmm. um, does happen sometimes. But I'd say 95 to 98 percent of the time I have something on. You okay. know, I trade across 37 different. If I was just trading the stock market, and I would be yeah. out of the market probably half the time or more, right? Yeah, you know, I'm trading 37 different markets because of that. You know, okay. that's one of the reasons. Um, and both directions. <laughs> both directions. True. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I, I, I was saying that I look at it like I'm counting cards, mm -hmm. and so I'm basically counting cards across 37 different tables. When a certain table gets a high count that's where i'll play you know mm -hmm. um so i usually have uh, typically three to five or six positions on okay um once in a while i'll have like eight if i have a lot like eight to ten different positions on that's good news because it means that i have a bunch that are in the money you know mm -hmm. i i can get 10 positions on at the same time but if i have two on and they're working and i put another two on and they're working then all of a sudden i might build up to eight to ten um that's always good news if I have that many positions on and do you have a typical length of time that you're you know, holding the you know, area? It typically takes typically about three months for them to go from sort of super crowded short and if mm -hmm. the trade is working, then all of a sudden the market starts going up. By the time they get out of those super crowded shorts and get back to neutral, it gets me out. Usually about three months, but that varies quite a bit. I, I've seen ones where it was two weeks. We just had one in the yen where we got you know long yen and two weeks later, you know, it, it got the out signal, right? Um, I've had one trade that lasted, I, I believe it was 20 months where okay. I was wrong fixed income for like 20 months um, back earlier this decade or last decade when fixed kept going up, kept going up, kept going up and everybody, all the fundamental people were selling into it, selling into it, selling into it. So they never got out of their shorts. So I just stayed with it, right? No way. Wow. Um, but it tends to be about three months for the winning mm -hmm. trades. And the, the news failure event, you know, because again, I mean, the way I look at it is the the commitment of traders kind of tells you, you know, you've got the right environment to, to trade in when it gets to those extremes. I, I think of that as the fuel and that news failure event is kind of your spark, right, to, to kind of light things up for you. Um, is, is there always a news failure event or are there other signals that, that you use? You know, again, just, just price review. I only use news failure events. Okay. Other people... Can use other things. Hey, if the moving average crosses or something like that, or the momentum changes, or, or this and that, I don't do that. I only do the one thing, which means I miss some trades sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. And then super crowded, market turns, or it just starts going. It goes without me. Okay, I didn't lose any money. Like you know what I mean? Like yeah, that's yeah. I do what I do, and then and it gives me the the return stream that I need it to give me. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do, right? Now, there's another level to that, too, which is that I have to be able to read that news failure, right? Right. Sometimes I can miss it. You know, hey, was that a news failure? Oh, I don't know. You know what I mean? Um, and that was going to be my next question. Like, I mean, how big of a news event does it have to be to 
kind of tell you, oh yeah, this. I always say if you have to question it, then it didn't happen. Okay. Well, okay. It should be obvious. So, so for instance, what about like the downgrade that, you know, Fitch's downgrade of, of the U.S. Is, is that? I mean, that's bad news. So what happened today? That's bad news. The market went down. Okay. So that made sense, right? Sense. At that point, you, you didn't, you didn't get that failure part. That, I'm always looking for the word, I think I said it in Schwager's book, but I'm always looking for the word despite. That's the key. <laughs> right. Yeah. You want a news failure event? Look at what happened in the energies today, right? This crude oil number today was the biggest miss, I think, in history, right? They're expecting a draw in crude of like, I'm making up numbers here, but a million barrels or something. And it drew like 17 million barrels, right? Which is a ridiculously huge number. Should have been massively bullish crude. And crude closed down today, right? There's a news failure event. Now, I'm not setting up to, sh- I'm not set up to short crude. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But if I were, I would have been shorting crude today on the close. And oh, the stop above today's high. But like, that's a news failure event. There was no, there just was no question about that, right? And another part that you were kind of telling us about uh, when we were when we were chatting pre-show was kind of your your pundit analysis, you know, uh, and and how how does that factor in? Uh, let's say you didn't have this commitment of traders. I think you said at one point that you know just by watching watching TV and when everyone is saying the same thing, reading off the same script that kind of tells you something too. So how do you use that effectively? So like I've had people say to me, what are you going to do if the CFT stop, T stops producing the commitments of traders reports? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I would just trade right off of CNBC because it's the same thing. You know, you can turn on the TV and you can listen and if you can bear it, having the TV on all day and listening to these people, there are many, many times where all of a sudden Every single person comes on there all day and says the same thing day, minute after minute after minute, the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. And that very, not coincidentally, shows up very correlated to this commitment to trader stuff, right? Mm-hmm. You know, they're all bearish and they're all this, then this is also going to show that people are super short, right? So it just kind of, I think it just makes me feel better about what I'm yeah. doing when I hear all the consensus of yeah. people. And there's people that I've been listening to for many years who I've watched be wrong very yeah. often. And some of them aren't wrong very often, but you can kind of smell when they're going to be wrong because they're going against what they do and, you know, they're doing something they don't do, right? All of a sudden they're switching to their stock pickers, but now they're switching to a macro view, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. 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 Like that, right? Yeah. So I like to pay attention to that. Um, as an example, like yesterday, I must have heard yesterday 40 people say the stock market is going to consolidate here before going to new highs later in the year Mm -hmm. right i must have heard 40 people say that yesterday Mm -hmm. so what i'm going to tell you is that's not what's going to happen so Mm -hmm. at least i can eliminate one thing from happening that's not what's going to happen what does that mean does that mean we're just going to go straight up without a consolidation or does that mean that the consolidation comes and it ends up being more than a consolidation and actually goes super down i don't know which one yeah. But I know which one ain't going to happen. Okay. That's, that's <laughs> going to like slowly consolidate and give everybody a chance to load up for the next run up. It, it right. doesn't work like that. Okay. All right. So I'm starting to get a feeling, and, and I don't act on this feeling until the data supports it. I'm starting to get a feeling if we are going to go down here, and we went down today, but one day doesn't mean anything. But, and we go down five, six percent or whatever. And People are gonna. I think people are gonna start buying into that, and it's gonna, it, that if they do, it will show up on this commitment of traders that they're super long. And if they do, then I do think that there is a risk in the market. And I haven't been bearish the stock market all year, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that would be the risk. Mm-hmm. Maybe that happens. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it goes down. Maybe they sell into it, you know? And they say, oh, finally the bear market's here, and they sell into it, and I will actually be buying it, then, right? Right. Um, I don't know which one. I have no way of forecasting which one they do. It's just kind of a gut feeling. I have a feeling that they might try to buy it. If, if they think that this is a dip before the next run up, then they're going to be buying into that dip would be my, my guess. So. And just to be clear, you know, there, there's a couple things here. You know, if if you're wrong, which could be, you know, that you 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 read the tea leaves wrong, you've got your risk management in place to to keep you out of trouble. Because again, you, you maybe it's early, maybe maybe it's a little bit further down the road that things, you know, turn, but you, you've got- I think that's what- what you're saying is is so much more important than anything I could say. 
Mm-hmm. That to me is everything. That that's everything. All the rest of this stuff is conversation. Mm-hmm. That is everything. You know, mm-hmm. whether you're right or wrong. You know, Drucken Miller says it all the time. Right? This is a man who has had an incredible success managing money in the markets. Right? He says it all the time. I am wrong far too often to count on being right as a way of making money. And <laughs> um, and, and that's. I think the most important thing that there is in this game, right? Mm. Everybody wants to be right. It feels good to be right and all that. You got to put that out of your mind, man. This, this shit is not about being right. Trying to be right or wrong is going to get you in trouble in this game, right? Mm. Um, just make money. Who, who cares? I, I love being wrong. If I can make money and be wrong every day, <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> exactly. Well, and as you said, you know, when the when the factors are four to one, you could be wrong a lot and still still do okay. No, my stuff is. I end up having about. And I've got twenty something years of history of this now, but I make money on about thirty eight percent of my trades. Okay, uh-huh. but if I make four on thirty eight percent and I lose one on the other, you know, sixty two percent, then you can do the math. It comes out basically to exactly what my retirement looked like. So, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, being right or wrong is it's just dangerous. You know what I mean? And uh, and I, I see people all the time. You know, I, I do these videos on YouTube and stuff, and people like put their comments down. And I very rarely am saying, oh, the market's going to do this. Or even I think that I, I, most of my videos are not necessary about what the market. They're more about things like risk management and how to mm-hmm. really approach this whole thing. Because that's really the message I'm trying to get out there. Not, hey, I'm a guru and I'm going to tell you what to do. Right? I'm trying to help people learn about what really matters. Right. Um, but when I do put market stuff, you'll get all these comments. Oh, well, I think that the market's going to. I'm like, okay, good for you, man. Like, right. I don't care what you think. And I don't care what I think for that matter either. Yep. Yeah. I'm playing a process, right? Like right. sitting there on a blackjack table. Oh, I think that here, that the dealer has 13. I think he's going to get a 10. Okay. And if he does, does that mean you were right? I mean, right. you guessed, but, and maybe you got it right that. I, like I always say, if I flip a coin, I call heads and it comes out heads. Does that mean I was right? Or does that just mean that there was a 50-50 chance of it coming up heads and it happened to come out heads, right? You were right that time. Right. <laughs> And, and I, I mean, that's just ego, right? right? I don't even think the word is right. You know what I mean? I think yeah. one, maybe not a 50 50 chance, you know? Yeah. So, I anyway, great. But I think that's what people confuse with this whole thing, right? They, yeah. They well, I, the I'm, and they want to be right about it. And it's the most dangerous thing there is. And that's why they lose money. I mean, the way I look at it, Jason, and, and I think you're a great example of this, is that that's ego. The, the ones who are yeah. that, the ones who are commenting are they want to be right. They want to feel like they're, they're good at this. As right. opposed to those who have survived the market for many, many years, they realize it's a process. They're going to be wrong a lot. So keep those losses small and and just ride the plan, right? You know, execute the plan, trade the plan. The whole game, man. The quicker you can admit you're wrong, the better you are. And you're right. It is all ego. And I get it. I- I'm a human being just like everybody else, right? Mm-hmm. We all want to be right. We, we all want to. But it, this stuff will. That's why most people are last doing this, right? Go be a lawyer. You know, you want to make an argument, you want to be right, you know, really, go be a lawyer, right? That's what you should do if you're good at making arguments. And, you know, these people make these arguments, so they're bearish. I- I've listened to it all year. Yeah. These people make these arguments about the bearishness, and, and and they sound totally legit, right? Yeah. They make total sense. It's legit. And, and they're saying, no, well, everything I said was right, except the, mo- you know, except the market went up. Right. And I think that's the market just doesn't know it yet. Yes. Yeah. So, that's right. That's the only thing that matters. Exactly. The market's going up. No, nothing's changed except price. Okay. Well, price is all that matters. So I don't care if you were right on all this stuff. It means nothing because you're not trading that stuff. You're trading the market, right? Mm-hmm. So all these kind of things, th- that kind of psychology and that kind of talk um, is what I love to hear people say, right? When I'm talking to listening to guys on CNBC and all that kind of stuff, when there's the guys have been saying that all year. Oh, we've been right the whole year. Well, you've been bearish the whole year. So I don't understand how you've been right the whole year if he's embarrassed the whole year. Right? We've got it on tape, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, when we come back, uh, we're going to get into a little bit more of some of the markets that you're currently looking at and how you do this analysis uh, with your commitment of traders and if there's any news events that you're looking at or potential failures. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, along with Arusha Pierce, who joins me every week. Uh, he's an O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. And our special guest this week, Jason Shapiro. Uh, he's the founder of Crowded Market Report. 
And before we get too fur and too much further, I want to kind of give people a sense of where they can find some of your stuff. Of course, they can go to crowdedmarketreport.com, uh, kind of you know find out a little bit more about your method. You've got a YouTube channel, and a lot of that YouTube stuff uh, people can get to through your Twitter uh, and or X, if, if that's what we're going with nowadays. Um, and that's at crowded underscore MKT underscore RPT. Is that correct? I believe that is correct. I, I got all that right, now, as far as you know. Um, so, okay. Uh, well, let's let's get right into uh, this this dollar trade, and and we can kind of go go through again a, a real time process with with how you do your analysis. So, um, for those people that are maybe listening to this, uh, you might just want to go on video and kind of see some of these charts that Jason's talking about with the commitment of traders. You can find that at investors dot com slash podcast. Um, but yeah, let's let's go ahead and take a look at. Uh, do you want to look at your commitment of traders um, chart? Would that be sure. most useful, or do you want to look at like the dollar itself? Well, if you look at the commitment of traders report, that's kind of where it all starts. Okay. So, like, what's crowded now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what it's been is these currencies. Mm -hmm. um, is really where it, where it's all at right now. So, if you go to like the euro and the pound, so you can see, like on the pounds, you see how the the red, the commercial stuff, got super short down there. Yeah, and the blue started getting super long, right? And then if you go to the euro, same thing. I forget the scroll. Uh, maybe yeah. right. You have to pay. Yep. So you can see same thing on the euro, right? Yeah. So at that point, I'm looking at getting short euro or getting short pound or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for this news failure type of thing. So like on the pound, um, the big day came on. Um, I'm just looking at my chart, but this was on July. 18th right okay. you had a bank of england um meeting on july 18th um and it was more hawkish um than people were expecting and the pound went up for a few hours as it should have mm -hmm. and it ended up reversing and closing down on the day so i'm getting short pound right there and i'm stopping out at the the high of that day um and you could also argue that the dollar index um bottomed uh on july uh 18th as well really i think it bottomed on the 14th which i don't remember what the data was but there was a piece of data that was um dollar bearish and the dollar mate went and made new lows and then reversed and closed up on the day so you could have looked at these other things and be like oh, i'm going to get long dollar index here or you could have waited for the british you know the, the central bank to come out and and, and Britain two days later and get short, you know, that then, um, which is how I do it. But, um, so when you look at the dollar index though, well, like I pulled up the, I think the right one here, mm -hmm. it, this is kind of neutral right here. So you wouldn't necessarily, uh, so here's the thing, it, it, is that neutral? Because it kind of looks like that to me when you compare it to the, yeah. okay. But what you have to do with this stuff and what I do with this stuff is I index it, right? So if you were going to, let's say, what, a year and a half chart or something like that? Yeah. If you were going to index that blue thing over that year and a half, then where would it be now? It shows them the least long. Oh, in that whole time. that's true. Okay. 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 Yeah. So of a quirk there. And, and there's certain things with that index that have negative things as well. Are you using the right index? Should it be six months, nine months, 12 months, 18 months? And you can back test all that stuff, but it's not very stable. You know what I mean? So there's a little bit of read on that as well. Um, but in general, you would see that the dollar index was showing it's the least long they've been. And you have to do that because you get things like gold, right? Yeah. Where um, commercials are never long gold on a net basis, right? Because they are mm -hmm. gold liners. So they're right. selling gold, right? Yeah. So they have to hedge that risk. <laughs> long gold. So on a net basis, yes. But on an index basis compared to history, you know, that that's where they can get there. Mm -hmm. So it's all relative and it's it's not the flip that you're looking for. It's just where is it in relation? So are you using like a, a stochastic, you know? Yeah, it's an oscillator. oscillator you know, right. Just making an oscillator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes obviously from zero to a hundred and, for my oscillator, for me to get short this, it has to show the specs like over 95% of my oscillator. Mm -hmm. And then when you get long, they have to be below five. Okay. But you know, so, that, 
that, that number's stupid anyway because it depends on your on, on how long you're looking back anyway. So right, it might be below five on a hundred day look back, but not below five on a two hundred day look back. And which one you're looking at it, and this is where it becomes a little bit tricky, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is why I then like to listen to the people on TV, right? Uh-huh. Because that yeah. kind of adds to it for me. And you can know, like on this dollar thing, like you get there's only one time in the history that it's the most it's ever been, right? So you can always go back and be like, okay, they're short year here, but they have been shorter in the past. Okay, because there's only one time in the entire, go back 40 <laughs> years, there's only one time when it could be the most, right? So if you yeah. wait for that, you're going to wait 40 years. You know? <laughs> um, so that's why I like to listen as well. You know, a few weeks ago, you know, nobody was talking dollar for months. And then all of a sudden the dollar started to collapse uh, in, in early July and was taking out your lows and all of a sudden it was all over the TV. All of a sudden they're all talking dollar again and dollar's going to die and da, 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 da. And then right as they're saying that we get this reversal day on, on what should have been a bearish piece of news. And I, I'm much more comfortable to say, okay, you know, because I always have to be aware of that index thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Now, are you look, since the dollar is, is kind of something you've identified, um, a lot of times people are doing the analysis of, okay, if the dollar does this, then, you know, the correlations that go along with it, you know, what is that doing for bonds? What is that doing for commodities? All of those things. Do you kind of extrapolate out or do you just say, look, it, it's, it's got to hit the, the commitment of traders or I've got to see it there. I'm not going to extrapolate out, you know, too much beyond. Um, the trade is the trade. I do the trade. Okay. But I do have a long history of extrapolating out. Okay. <laughs> it's sort of for fun of it. You know, uh-huh. um, either I don't know if it's fun, but also to get it in my mind. I mean, whatever, you know, as much as I'm trying to be a robot, I am still paying attention and listening to stuff. So let, let's do that. If the dollar is going to go up because people are so crying, and this is how I do macro analysis, right? I don't do macro analysis by looking at my spreadsheets and say, oh, here's my forecast for GDP in Germany and China and the US. And therefore, this is what's going to happen, right? Because I have no way of knowing any of that stuff, nor do I believe there's anybody, right? But if the odds are the dollar is going to go up, that probably means that rates are going to go higher, right? And if rates are going to go higher, that probably means the economy is going to be stronger, continue to be stronger than people expect, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and bonds are probably going to go down, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, I, I then overlay that with sort of the, the positioning stuff and see if that all kind of makes sense in those terms. And none of it affects how I'm actually going to trade, but it does make for sort of an interesting outlook um, to that and tends to be pretty good over time. Um, you know, a- at the beginning of this year, we all know what it looked like at the beginning of this year, right? We already saw that people were super short stock, right? Now but we know that they were all calling for a recession the second half of this year. They were all calling for the market to have a horrible first half of this year. And then mm-hmm. possibly rebound in the second half of the year as it discounted coming out of inflation, right? Mm-hmm. And I have many interviews that I did at the end of last year talking about this, right? Mm-hmm. So clearly the contrarian trade was to be long stocks, right? And everybody was calling for a recession. And what I was saying then was if you want to take the purely contrarian view, right? Then the contrarian view is the stock market's going to go up. There's not going to be a recession. And in fact, People are calling for recession and business people, forget about market participants, but if business people are getting ready for a recession, which means that they are underinvesting because they're getting ready for recession, then I'm yeah. halfway through the year and there hasn't been the recession. Now they have to catch up just like stock would They're going to have to ramp you know? up. Yeah. Now they have to catch up. So you ramp up. So you're actually going to have more growth than uh-huh. people thought instead of recession. And I think that's exactly what's going on here, yeah. right? So that's all great. It's too late for that because we're six months later. So what does that mean from now, right? Um, and I personally think that it means that this is hopefully what's going to get people to finally capitulate to the long side is they're going to give up on the recession thing. The numbers are going to, and you see the numbers are coming out as exactly that, right? So the numbers will continue to come out stronger growth. People will hopefully then it'll be like a Goldilocks type of thing. People will have to give up on this short idea. They will get super long, right? The Fed will stop raising rates, which will get the curve to uninvert, right? And then 
Then the recession will come, right as they're getting along and <laughs> right. you know what I mean? I mean that's how it always happens, right? Yeah, right. Right as they're getting along and right as they're buying into that, right under the nose, it will all be changing and that will cause the market to go down. I, I don't think we're a month away from that. I, it feels to me like we are months away from that, if not mm-hmm. six months to a year away from that. But that's kind of how it feels to me based on what you're talking about, looking at the different things together as one big puzzle. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of how it feels to me. Like everybody's so excited about the Fed. I've been saying since last August and have been completely wrong about it, that this market will top the day that the Fed says they are no longer raising rates, right? And I was saying that they were going to say that last October and that mm-hmm. was clearly wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because they're still raising rates and we're all the way at the next August already, right? Yeah. But I still believe that. And I think it makes sense in, in a lot of different ways, right? Because it's, you know, they've been raising rates and therefore the long end, you know, isn't going up. You know, the interest rates are the long end because everybody's expecting, you know, they control the short end, but they can't control the long end. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, if the Fed keeps raising rates, there's going to be less inflation, there's going to be less growth. So therefore, 10 year rates don't have to go up. Mm-hmm. Well, just like they stop raising rates, everyone's going to forget that idea, and the ten years will go up, right? And they'll be like, "Oh, well, now we're back to normal." There's a, you know, a, the yield curve is normal because there's growth and all that, and like I say, end will pile in right at the wrong time, uh, right? Well, and you have that, you know, every, everyone's been talking about the inverted yield curve for, uh, gosh, it, it, it's it's going on years now, right? That it's that has been inverted, um, and that's usually the the telltale sign that a recession is coming, um, you know, down the road. So, you know, when you have something like that, that, you know, everyone is looking like, oh, this, this is like an a hundred percent thing. Do you take a contrarian view on that as well? Uh, like, well, not, not necessarily. I do. Yeah. Depending on positioning, right. Mm-hmm. Depending on positioning, like my old question was, okay, it's forecasting a recession. First of all, I would argue that the yield curve has forecasted 10 of the last five recessions, right? Mm-hmm. Or is it five or less, ten, whatever? You know, <laughs> yes, it's forecasted all the recessions correctly, but it's also- It's either false positives or false negatives. Yes. Right? <laughs> so there's that, right? And people probably with a lot more brains than I can probably prove me wrong there. I don't know. But does something definitely have to happen? Right, just because, yeah. Just because, like, that's not how markets work. That might be how life works, right? If the best football team in the world is playing the worst football team in the world, they're going to beat that, Right. But that's not the question. The question is, what's the point spread? You know, if you're betting on it, then what's the point spread? And if everybody knows that the best team's going to beat the worst team, then the point spread's going to obviously be very high. So if everybody knows that a recession is coming and they're prepared for it, then does the market have to go down just because a recession's coming? I, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. That's like, where does it say that a market has to go down if a recession comes? I mean, what we know at the end of the day that the market discounts 20 to 25 years of cash flow. And don't we know that if there's a recession that we will eventually come out of it? Yeah. So what's the point of it going down anyway? Like, I, I don't even understand. <laughs> and a lot of times you don't know you were in a recession until after the fact. <laughs> well, that's right. That's right. <laughs> like, I, don't get, like, I don't get that whole thing. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not betting on recession. I'm betting on the S&P 500 okay, or whatever the hell I'm betting on, right? So right. I, I think that depending if it's discounted in is the more important question, right? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It's when it's not discounted in that, that, that'll come. And that's why I think if the market's going to go down, if they all chase the, oh, now there's no recession, then the risk becomes a there's recession, right? Coming into this year, I didn't think that there was any risk in the market. Like, I don't know if there's going to be a recession. I'm no economist, right? But I don't think that there was any risk in the market whatsoever if there ever a recession came because everybody was so short and so bearish and so prepared for that. Yeah. And again, it's like, okay, so it didn't come. Okay, so the market went up, right? But if it did come, your downside was so small relative to your upside. And, and there's no way to prove that because we can't go back in time. But I can tell you the NASDAQ was not going down 40%. Um, if there was a recession coming, you know what I mean? It might've gone down and, and I, maybe you would have got stopped out of longs or whatever, but it wasn't going to do what it did, you know? And the reason it did what it did was because everybody was so short into this. And that's why, you know, it ran up, you know what I mean? Are we going to sit here and justify what these companies have done and all this stuff? I couldn't do that, you know, in the video, whatever it is, you know? Okay, if AI is going to take over the world or whatever, and then you could justify it. But I, I don't know if that's the case or not. And I don't really care. 
know? Yeah. Um, it's just not a question of that for me. It's all a question of risk reward and how to measure it. And, and to me, it's all about measuring it by positioning because that's the discounting process. And, and I guess one last question uh, to kind of wrap up this this portion of it is, you know, are, are you paying attention that much to like individual stocks um, and, you know, earnings reports? We're in earnings season right now. Are you paying attention to like what the estimates are and what the companies are coming out and saying, the guidance that they're giving as just one more piece of the puzzle to kind of say, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're beating estimates or, you know, they're beating estimates, but, you know, gosh, th- they had lowered the estimates so much from beforehand. So of course they're beating the estimates. They're beating lowered estimates. I, what, what, how, how much into the weeds do you get? I pay attention mm-hmm. to all of it mm-hmm. just because I'm listening to the TV and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching these, these aftermarket shows and stuff. Um, so I'm paying attention. Does it affect what I'm doing? Not so much. If I'm looking to get short the stock market, let's say, and, you know, Apple comes out with earnings that just kick the shit out of it. Mm-hmm. And NASDAQ ends up closing down that day. I might consider that a news failure event. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I'm not looking to get short the NASDAQ here. So that doesn't matter to me. But if I were, yeah, and what happened, I, I might consider that a news failure event. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm trying to pay, uh, you know, look, this is what I do. So, you know, and I don't, I'm not sitting here day trading and, you know, I have very few trades that I do, you know. So my actual actions are not very active, but I still sit in front of this screen. You know, I don't know how many hours a day, 15 hours a day or whatever. So I am paying attention. And, and I do have this Discord page, you know, that's part of this crowded market report. And we have a lot of people on there that are paying attention. You know, we have a whole bunch of different threads and they're talking about this and, you know, a bunch of day traders in there and individual stock traders and all this. So they talk about it a lot. So I, I find it all interesting, you know, but I have tried to take the interesting out of my actual trading. Yeah. Are you <laughs> using that Discord page as another potential gauge on sentiment and whether too many people are leaning? I mean, we, we, no, we, we say it on there all the time, not just other people, but me as well. Let's say, you know, whatever, we have something long on, right? And as much as I ask these people not to mimic my trades, because I think that's a bad idea for a number of reasons, clearly people still do, right? Yeah. So we end up with a lot of the same trades on, and somebody will be like, oh man, this thing is killing it. And I'll be like, high tick. It's bad. I'm in a, I don't know. Yeah. You just high ticked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, me too. Okay? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Boom, high tick. Never done yeah. Yes. Uh, so clearly, you can, and all of a sudden, you'll see, well, off the same trade that's working, all of a sudden, the Discord gets loud and everybody's joking and having a good time. Uh, uh, yes. yeah. the, <laughs> the kiss of death. You know? Uh, so, yeah, the, the, there's you can, any group of people you can use. Oh, we, we, that happens to, to us too. Socially, because it happens to all of us all the time, right? We know this. It's a habit that we've seen, right? So the answer is yes, I do. Um, I'm not really going to get short something because everybody in there is getting long because most of the time if they're all getting long it's because the commitment of traders is saying to get long and you know and all that so i'm law right right um but it, it's amazing how many times uh how many times that happens well jason it was a real pleasure having you on uh again for people that are interested in finding out more about how jason approaches the, the contrarian view here the commitment of traders All of that, you can find it at crowdedmarketreport.com. Go to his Twitter. uh, That's at crowded underscore MKT underscore RPT. And uh, certainly I think it's it's very useful reading uh, Schwager's book, uh, The Unknown Market Wizards, and and hearing your story. I I, I thought it was a fascinating story. Um, You know, uh, a a very, very interesting life, the time you spent in the monastery. I mean, there's a lot lot to unpack there, but but that was uh, fun, fun reading. So. Uh, thanks again for coming on the show, Jason. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been great to have you guys.